Greetings, this is David Kassmeyer from the Cycles of Change radio program here on location in Wilmington, Delaware. We're speaking with investment advisor James H. Lee, who's going to tell us a little bit about what he does for his clients and some comparisons he's found in the study of cycles per se and his on the field research and active use of investment advising for his clients. Jim, thank you for being with the program here. Good morning. Thank you for having me, David. Always a pleasure. Jim, would you tell our listeners a little bit about your company and what you do? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, again, my name is Jim Lee. I am the founder of Strategic Foresight Investments. And uh, what we do is uh, primarily individual portfolio management using and integrating long-term trends with investment analysis. So uh, our goal really is to build portfolios that are optimized across multiple time frames for our clients. Indeed, and it was your analysis of long-term trends and more, which is how I first found you because of your landmark work, Resilience. Yeah. Here it is, Resilience. And the future of everyday life. So yes, thank you, thank you. And it was a wonderful opportunity um, to write that book and really look at how people in different generations are adopting to uh, the economic uncertainty that we've been experiencing over the course of the last few years and actually yeah. integrates very nicely with some of the work that uh, David Katzmeyer has been doing on social cycles. I've heard of that too. <laughs> uh, Jim, uh, your book, I want to go back to that, Resilience, mm -hmm. uh, that is available where? Can they find it on your website? Yeah, it's available online at Amazon.com Yes, uh, and also BarnesandNoble.com in both physical and also uh, digital versions as well. And um, it's available locally here in Wilmington. I'm a Wilmington-based advisor, and they have it here at the Ninth Street Bookstore as well. Well, I've met some of the people in this area who do follow your work. And your website, Jim, where is that? Yeah, the website is www.stratfi, S-T-R-A-T-F-I dot com. And uh, there you'll find access to my monthly newsletter where I write about emerging investment trends on the blog. I also blog for the World Future Society. And I'm also available on Twitter at J-H-L-I-N-D-E. Thank you, Jim. I wanted our followers uh, to be able to follow you on this and maybe do what I did and look at some of the amazing correlations that could be found. When you're just studying any field, which is mm -hmm. your field is financial, it seems that the world of cycles keeps coming up. The inveterate procession of underlying dynamic forces are going to manifest in anything we do. Mm -hmm. No, I did not rehearse that. Well, that's good. That's good. That's really good. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But Jim, uh, first of all, give us a, a little bit of an insight of how you analyze the market and how you bring the information that you find to your clients. What field are we working in? Here? Sure. Well, we're actually working across three different fields at the same time, which is what makes it so interesting. Is it actually took me about fifteen years worth of research to get the expertise across multiple fields to do what I do, which is what I refer to as convergence investing. So briefly, when you make an investment, there are really sort of three questions that you need to ask yourself. Uh, the first is where, in terms of geographic opportunities and industrial opportunities. The second is what, you know, more specifically, uh, what investment vehicle. And then the third is when, okay? And that's really a matter of timing. It's the ins and outs of things. So for the first question, which is the what, um, I've uh, studied a field called strategic foresight, which is really about using what we know about the future to make better decisions today. Okay, so I'll take a look at some of the big emerging uh, trends, whether it's three-dimensional printings or robotics or the internet of things, to sort of say that over the course of the next 10 or 20 years, this is an area that you need to have exposure to because there's a lot of interesting things going on. Mm -hmm. Second level is, um, is, is, is sort of the issue of, of, of what. What do you buy and what are the best angles here? And for that, you really need um, conventional financial analysis. Uh, and that's where my background as a CFA comes in to look at which companies are making money, which companies are profitable, which ones are well financed, and do some competitive analysis looking within that field to see whether you should buy a company like Stratasys versus 3D Systems Corp if you're interested in something like three-dimensional printing. Yes. 
So the third tier is actually called technical analysis, which deals with looking at investor confidence and market sentiment. Mm. And that's zooming in and looking at the day-to-day -day trading activity to really sort of figure out how you can get the best deal going in and how you can get the best timing on the exit going out. And what's interesting about these three um, techniques, these three tools, is that they're useful in informing for three different time frames. Strategic foresight will give you the big picture look over the course of the next three to ten years, okay? And this is where you need to be. The financial analyst work gives you a time frame of anywhere between three months to about three years. And at that point, the shelf life of financial analysts sort of expires because times change. Mm. And then the technical analysis work, which really looks at things like trading momentum, um, overbought versus oversold conditions, market volume, these kinds of things. That's useful, generally speaking, in the um, one day, very short term, to typically about the three year time frame, right? So when you stack these three layers of analysis together, you get into the right neighborhood, into the right house, so to speak, at the right time. And mm -hmm. enables you to find something that makes sense that you can hold on to, hopefully for a while, and reduce your portfolio turnover. So you almost triangulate your analysis in terms of what and where. I so optimize my analysis by looking at the convergence of trends, short-term, mid-term, and long-term trends, all at the same time. When you do that, you have to identify patterns. Is that how you can have a foresight in what you're doing? Um, well, there are patterns exist on a few different levels. You have patterns in terms of social trends, and there are seven major social trends that I'm following, and those interact in some very specific ways. But um, there are also chart patterns and price patterns in the prices of individual securities, and that's something that you study as a technical analyst. Indeed. As you follow these figures in depth and you find effective ways of analyzing them uh, to increase the possibility of a good forecast, have you found that you've come across the existence of wave tendencies in this? Have you found cycles analysis has played a role in any of this? Cycles are a big deal. And there are a few different ways of doing forecasting. One is sort of a straight line analysis, right? And another one is to look at cycles. And trends generally follow straight lines, although when you back up long enough, they turn into cycles. So that's what you have. And what I've found in my work is that cycles analysis is one of the few tools that ahead of time will inform you in terms of not only your entry point, but also your exit point as well. And it's one of the few forms of analysis that will give you the answer to both questions. Indeed. So if you can forecast possibly an exit point when you come across a cycle, you discover a cycle in right. what you're following. Mm -hmm. I'd like to ask how do we define a cycle in that case? Do we find a cycle as merely a sequence of events, regardless of how long it takes for that pattern to go through, or are we talking about a periodic cycle which has a fixed duration? Um, yeah, generally speaking, you have cycles that tend to follow more fixed durations, plus or minus, right? Yes. Okay, so as Mark Twain says, you know, history seldom repeats itself, but it usually rhymes. Yes, that's true. And, and that's what I'm finding, right? Yes. So. Uh, within my work as an investment advisor, uh, the cycles that we tend to follow the most closely, one is the four-year presidential election cycle, okay? yes, yes. which at, in advance of this year, statistically speaking, you can kind of tell that it's going to be a flatter, choppier year than last year was, which was basically straight up. Um, 2015, from an election cycle perspective, should be stronger than 2014. 
So that's one cycle. That's a four-year cycle. Okay. A man-made cycle. Man-made cycle, and, and you know, not only should cycles work in practice, but they should work in theory as well. Yes. And the theory, of course, here has to do with with government spending stimulating the economy going into the next election. We should see more of that stimulatory effect going into 2015 and 2016. Yes, okay, and so. we've certainly had a very expansive time in government spending since the year 2000, basically. Right. Uh, under uh, two different administrations, we've had a great deal of expansion. But uh, that's not just a steady line of progression. There seems to be waves in this, and one of that is preceding an election year is what you're right. finding. Right, right, and this is well documented. A terrific resource on, on all of these cycles is actually something called the Stock Traders Almanac, which is kind of like the Farmer's Almanac for investment types like me. And it's really fascinating. Another type of cycle that I tend to follow fairly closely are what's called seasonality, which honestly I've been in the business for 10 years before I really understood what seasonality was about. And that is there's certainly predictable behaviors, not only for individual industries, but for the market as well over the course of the year. Um, relatively few people know that most of the money in the stock market, the U.S. stock market, is generally made between the months of October and April, okay, the very beginning of April. Indeed. Over that period of time, the market generates most of its returns. If you look at the returns from May through the beginning of October, generally speaking, the market just goes sideways. You can go on vacation, you can buy bonds, or you can dollar cost average, but not much is going on over that period of time. Does this affect more in agricultural business, or does it have to do with maybe technologies as well? Because when you say seasonal, I'm thinking yearly, and yeah. I'm thinking of the change of seasons, how it might affect some businesses. But maybe not as much in others. What is that across the board? Or? Well, we've had a cold winter here in Wilmington and on the East Coast. And really, people got really serious about their business. They started thinking about their money. They started taking their investing more seriously. And, um, you know, I've certainly been very busy over the last few months. Um, over the summertime, people tend not to be as actively engaged in their portfolios. They tend to spend more money, they tend to go on vacation and not think about it. Um, actually, prior to 1950, the strongest month for the market was August, because we did have more of an agricultural economy at that time, and that was harvest season. That's when people made their money, and that's when they started to stimulate the economy. Yes. So there's been a little bit of a shift in the sources of our income, which has in turn shifted the timing of the broad market. Kind of interesting to watch. Okay. And the world is flat with uh, trading internationally more, less nationalistic, and sometimes we import a lot of our foods. So does this right. help smooth out the seasonal trends in some ways? Or uh, what, as you're well, saying, it's shifted. They exist globally, time. right? Yes. So you can actually have a very interesting strategy, which in the course of our winter, you would buy Stockholm, right? You know, buy Swedish. And then in the summer, if you move your money down into the southern hemisphere, into Buenos Aires, for example, you could catch a their winter and you would get, you know, 10 or 12% out of Stockholm for half of the year, 10 to 12% over the long term out of Buenos Aires, hopefully just for inflation. And that seasonal effect affects both hemispheres although at different times, which is pretty yes. pretty interesting. It is yeah. pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. So you're saying a seasonal investor today should think more internationally than perhaps a seasonal investor from 50 years ago. That is, that is correct because, one, it's a lot easier to buy internationally than it has been in the past. But these cycles are, in fact, fairly global and can be applied accordingly. So uh, in one cycle, actually, that I wanted to talk about today a little bit, just in terms of, of more recent trends and dynamics is what's been happening with Russia and the Ukraine. Yes. And that I'm beginning to sense that we have a fairly unique opportunity here uh, from the perspective that if you look at pullbacks due to war or due to aggression or concerns about international conflict, historically speaking, you have about a 20, 24 percent markdown in stock prices. And that's actually what we've had within the Russian securities market over the last three months, 
24% off by any measurement a very strong bear market. Mm. But lo and behold, it seems like they have been able to integrate or they will be integrating a new territory into their union, as it were, in, in what appears to be a bloodless conflict at this point. Yes. And from a fundamental perspective, from a financial analysis perspective, I'm beginning to find some things there that appear to be fairly significantly oversold at this point. So, oh, that's so that's kind of an interesting way, again, of factoring in some of these global factors with the financial factors, with the technical factors. They're kind of coming together here and they're saying the same thing. So, um, the, the uh, Ukraine had long been considered the breadbasket of the Soviet Union. And right. then since the breakup, um, perhaps they want to bet a little bit of that good economy producing area back, but did that uh, spawn competitive speculation when uh, we saw that they were going to be successful in their acquisition? And, uh, and is that why we're overbought in that area? Very now? political, very fast, right? Yes. You know, it sort of turned into a land grab. And from a game theoretic perspective, the Europeans don't want to intervene too much because they don't want to lose their natural gas supplies. From yes. Russia, right? They yes. can't. We're not in the position to do anything here in the U.S. And they actually yeah. ended up acquiring this land by what appears to be a democratic process, okay? And you can take that as, it, as you will. Mm -hmm. But the point is, is that the markets have, I think, overreacted to this, creating some very interesting shorter-term opportunities for speculators. So just kind of putting that out there. I mean, the other thing, too, is that as you do sort of this, you know, geographic arbitrage type of thing, you always do need to manage your risk exposures. And, you know, by that, I certainly wouldn't be comfortable owning any more than 2 to 4% of a portfolio in, in, in a country like Russia at this point as an American investor. But it's something to look at. So, so this comes from the sophistication of convergence analysis because you're looking at short-term, mid-term, and long-term analysis. And that right. gives you a better picture than just zooming in too much with the microscope. Well, that's where the growth is. I mean, the growth that we're seeing in the consumer markets are not in the United States anymore. They're more in the Eastern markets. Mm. So, you know, just as a, an aside, there's a book written a, uh, a few years ago called Stocks for the Long Run, uh, written by a University of Pennsylvania professor named Jeremy Siegel. And this came out around 2002, 2004. And how would you spell Siegel? Um, S-I-E-G-E-L. I believe. Yes, okay. Yes. Thank you. So um, what he did is he looked at the data for the S&P 500, which just hit its 50th anniversary. And the question that he had was, for the first 50 years of the Standard Poor's 500, which company made the most money and who did the best? Okay? And the answer actually was Philip Morris, which no. had a compound return of about 18% annually for 50 years. Wow. Which is amazing, and it was followed by other companies such as Cook, Cola, and Johnson and Johnson, all of which are very much consumer goods companies. Yes. Okay, name brands. We had a consumer culture at that time, which flourished for about fifty years, and we're transitioning out of that now. Okay, mm. so these were the companies that Peter Lynch, at the Fidelity Magellan Fund, made his name on during the 1980s. It was on the show, by the way. It, this show? Yes. Oh, that is excellent. Yeah. Oh, that, that's awesome. So anyway, so the question is, is we've finished this time of long-term cyclical expansion here in the U.S. We've had the, the, the baby boomers benefiting from this greatly. We have the millennials who are kind of rejecting these traditional consumer values, as it were. They're becoming the first post consumer generation, okay? Mm. They're not buying houses, they're living with mom and dad. They're not buying cars, they're renting or they're car sharing or they're living in the city where they can take the metro. And in many cases, they're not ready to commit or, or form families yet, okay? So they, these are not the engines of consumption that we have had in previous generations. So again, looking at the big picture, looking at the strategic foresight piece, where are the growth opportunities going to be over the course of the next 20 years? And I'm going to say they're going to be much more focused on health care and taking care of this boomer generation as they get older. 
we're becoming less materialistic. We're consuming less. We are consuming word. differently. Differently. Um, we're consuming digital media more. Yes. Okay. But we're consuming physical things much less than we used to. And it's interesting because in, in some cases people are wholesale downscaling and abandoning their stuff. Um, public libraries, for example, many of them are no longer accepting book donations. <laughs> at the library. At the library because people have cleaned out their bookshelves yeah. and they're just running off their Kindle at this point. Okay? Yes. Um, we're actually seeing storage companies and storage facilities booming because people might not be ready to get rid of their stuff. But now it's in the way. But it's in the way. <laughs> so they're just putting them in these big cart cartons and storing them away for, you know, for a while until they can eventually make up their minds. Behavior is influencing the market. You talk about some of these things in your book, don't you, about how uh, people are using zip cars or maybe rental bicycles instead of owning cars and right. so forth. And yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So our consumerism has changed. Uh, Consumer-based industries may not be the leader. More service-based industries might be. The more more service-based industries, and the trend is away from ownership yes. towards access. And uh, yeah. one term for this is called collaborative consumption. Okay. So one of the trends that I write about in my book is, is really um, the idea, for example, of moving the household away from being a unit of consumption, something that you fill over time for material comforts, to becoming something of a, 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 a sort of a source of production, which I'm seeing particularly within the Generation X group, who I refer to as the new homesteaders, right? So we're seeing a resurgence in home-based businesses, we're seeing people renting out spare rooms on websites such as Airbnb. We're seeing a rise in home-based agriculture through micro-farming and through gardening. We're seeing actually an increase also in home power uh, through the solar power industry, which is very well positioned right now on both the financial basis, the strategic foresight basis, and the momentum basis. Okay, so there's, there's an opportunity for you. Um, so the shift is towards empowering individuals during a period in which there's declining belief in our institutions. So that's a real big one right there. A departure from the inveterate institutions of the machine era as we move away from the military industrial complex as the center and become more global and more international. More connected. More connected. Right? Right? Yes. And what's happening is that the machine era was the era of mass production and mm. big things, big institutions, big companies. What's happening right now with three-dimensional printing, for example, and, and desktop uh, publishing and businesses and so forth, is that the means of production is slowly becoming democratized. It's getting pushed out to individuals and if you look at the size of companies, successful companies, successful institutions, they're shifting away from employing thousands and thousands of people to employing maybe a dozen, okay? Mm -hmm. So if you look at um, Polaroid in the 1960s, had over 100,000 employees. Mm -hmm. You look at Instagram when they were bought out, I think they had 16 people, right? Yes. Um, you look at some of these startups, they may go public with fewer than 50 people or get bought out with fewer than half a dozen. So what's happening is the size or the units of product production and productivity are getting much, much smaller, which to me suggests that the focus in the portfolio is to look more towards small and mid-cap companies where mm -hmm. the growth is mm -hmm. versus the large blue-chip established companies which are slowly going to be losing market share to these small competitors. That's an important thing to, for people to get into the psyche of investing because, you know, a lot of people have long viewed the traditional blue chips as the secure investment, but the world trend is kind of taking us away from that. We're decentralizing hugely. Well, this it's is stability what without the, growth. Uh, Alton said. Yeah, it's stability without growth. That's what you get, right? You stability may get some growth. income, right? Yeah. But you don't get growth. And the same thing occurs when you look at um, our national economy. Mm -hmm. We're sort of in this muddle through economy, right, where 
we don't really have rising employment, we don't really have rising GDP, there is more stability now than we had you know, four or five years ago, obviously during the financial crisis. But the growth exists in pockets, okay? Growth is not everywhere. You have to find it. And um, you know, one, one quote that uh, science fiction writer William Gibson came up with a few years ago is this idea that the future is already here, it's just not very evenly distributed. <laughs> Okay, so so if the future is already here, the question is, where do you find it? Where does it want to live, and how can you track it down, right? And that's what my job is as a futurist and as an investment guy is yeah. finding the future, finding these growth opportunities over the course of the next decade or two. And you do that through analysis. Yes, heavy analysis. Because the details tell the story, the proof is in the pudding. Yep, you bet. And oddly enough, being a financial advisor keeps me honest as a futurist. Well, figures tell the story, don't they? And uh, <laughs> yeah, we're off to a very good start. And that's why I'm so enthused by since the figures keep you honest and uh, and the trends tell the story that you have found that the existence of cycles. Do we have a herd mentality? Is that why we move sometimes? I mean, there's seasonal trends that's imposed by the tropical year. We have a four-year cycle coinciding with the man-made election cycle of every four years in this mm -hmm. country. But other than the, the clockworks that are in place because of nature and because of our um, founding of a political cycle, are there other trends that can be found that indicate that we seem to have a collective behavior. Well, we do, and there's actually an emerging social field um, that studies that particular effect, and it's called socionomics, okay? And that's the intersection between collective social mood and economics. And you have periods of rising mood and, and rising trust, and you have periods of declining mood and declining collective trust. Um, so that's a whole area that was actually pioneered by a market technician by the name of Robert Prechter. And, oh, yes. uh, locally, we actually have a, a fairly um, uh, significant, I'd say, guru, but very few people know him at this point by the name of Peter Atwater, who wrote a book called Moods and Markets, which is excellent, and, and everyone needs to read it. It's fascinating to learn that when you're going in, you're looking at what is in the market, and you're not necessarily saying, well, here's a cycle I think exists. What do I find out there that might fit it? You don't commit isogesis. That's a big word. That's a good one. Yeah, That's yeah. a good one. Yeah, yeah. Um, which means basically selecting whatever data supports your theory. You're going in and looking at the data first, and then you're finding the trends by the analysis that you put on short term, medium term, and long term with right. the convergence uh, because you have to find something that resonates as true and has yield some predictability yeah. for your clients in what's a very growing business. Yeah, yeah, it's what I call eating low on the food chain, okay? And that's looking at the data, getting down and dirty at what's actually happening and reaching your own conclusions, okay? Yes. If you're waiting for the media to tell you what to do, you're gonna be late on the trade. And, and one you don't who follows in another's tracks cannot pass. Right. right. So, so again, you need to, to be able to figure out where things are happening, pay attention, and then set up your trades. Be aware of what's happening now, and realize that sometimes what's happening now is the influence of cycles mm -hmm. that come in different forms, but sometimes are periodic, more or less. And when you have convergence analysis and you keep up with the data, you can understand the trends in our behavior because the trends are there and that's something you should know before mm -hmm. you invest. Mm -hmm. James H. Lee, author of Resilience and the Future of Everyday Life. Uh, your website again, Jim? Yeah, www.stratfi, S-T-R-A-T-F-I.com. You can also look it up as strategicforesightinvestments.com. It all sends you in the same place and we're also optimized for mobile as well. There you are, folks. The impact of cycles in our lives doesn't just change what entertainment we watch, how wide our neckties, the uh, height or length of skirts, but they show up always in investment and in our economy because we are all one and everything is interconnected. Mm -hmm. I'm David Katzmeyer here with James H. Lee on the Cycles of Change radio program. Thank you for listening.